Hit it, Phil. Da, 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 da. Can it be the breeze that fills the trees with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no. <laughs> it isn't the breeze. It's Jackson time. La, da, da, da. Well, Joel, again, this is uh, Buck Benny speaking. Uh, we have uh, another episode for you here of the Jack Benny TV show. Today's episode is... Um, we're doing it kind of as a tribute to Sean Connery, though Sean Connery is not in very much of this episode, but he is in a little piece <laughs> of this episode. So we thought we would do that with his passing this last week or so. And um, and anyway, so I just thought we'd bring this one out and it gives us a chance to talk a little bit. It's got Mary in it. It's it's one of the, the what I think of as the traveling episodes and we can talk about how those work too. So. Anyway, we'll start, we'll go from there, and I'll let Kathy go first today. So, Kathy, what did you think about the episode, and what do you know, do you know anything about these traveling episodes, and how they came to be, and that sort of thing? Well, well, well that's, um, Jack in the, this is mid-50s, right? So, um, uh, Jack is uh, uh, spending more time in Europe between the um, uh, shows in England uh, when he's off the uh, uh, TV in the summer, but also sort of uh, a change of pace. I, I sort of wonder if people, Americans back at the time watching it, almost sort of treated this as an advertisement for going back to Europe, that traveling there is safe again. But also this idea is America as a fortress and that Europeans are, are uh, sophisticated and strange and evil and speak foreign languages. And I love the attempts of, of these shows to sort of say, here's the bumbling American yes. in Europe. And, and um, uh, if, if he can do it, you can do it too. Um, I, I, I love how um, he was up in all these episodes, mostly to shop, but also that it, it sort of <laughs> brought out sort of goodwill ambassadors like um, Maurice Chevalier in the French episode and, and things like this. So I just, I, I sense... Um, trying to imagine being an American watching the show back in the day. They said, I, I, I sense that people are um, scared, curious about Europe after the war, but, but not knowing if they could go over. And these, right. these shows were kind of like, hey, let's go to mm -hmm. Disney World. Hey, let's, let's try and go to the, the large European cities and, uh, and see things. They're not my favorite episodes because they're, they're more travelogue than mm -hmm. funny, but there you go. There you go. Absolutely. Well, and I think it's interesting that that, like you're saying, they um, maybe make people more comfortable with going to Europe and that sort of thing. But the fact that these were done years after he'd already done these same episodes, essentially for the radio show, and yep. the radio show was yep. he did them. I want to say in like right at the beginning of 1950, maybe even 49 and 50 is when he was doing most of these travel episodes. And so that would even be closer to when the war had just ended just a few years before that. So so I never really thought about it that way that you just mentioned it, Kathy. And that's why you're here. So <laughs> let's uh, let's go on to, to get John's impression of, of the episodes and what he thought. Yeah, I, I loved seeing Mary because Mary's not in a lot of the television shows. So it's yeah. it's fun to see her. And uh, I think she's very different than she was in like the early days of radio. Uh, but it's still Mary. So it's still fun to see her. And, and, you know, Jack and her obviously are very close and have that sort of banter relationship. So that's fun. I must admit, critically, like, it, the episode does not work as well as some episodes and I blame some of that on the fact that it's not live yes. like sometimes they'll do like insert shots of Jack's reaction and just the timing is not the same as Jack actually doing a reaction with an audience so there's just there's something about it being live and you never know what's going to happen and so you see Jack's reaction and you're like oh of course he would react like that that doesn't quite work the same way when it's filmed and the you got an editor doing the timing rather than Jack himself. Well, and there were some parts. Jack isn't known for his timing, so it really doesn't hurt <laughs> yeah. that they have totally messed up timing on Jack. It's not like he's considered the the man with the best timing in all of the history of television and radio. But anyway, but 
the thing is, Jack is not really a behind the scenes guy when it comes yeah. to that, like some other people like Charlie Chaplin was, where he yes. was there doing the editing and things like that. So, I mean, that is too bad. He probably, if he was into that, he probably could have made it a little bit better. Uh, but there are a couple of uh, parts that I really liked, uh, like the reveal. Um, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but most people are listening and they won't see it's it okay anyway. The reveal when decades and decades old, we're okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> when his na his uh, you know room neighbor uh, is singing, and then they go and they cut, and you see the fact that it's a a record player, and you know Jack's gonna you know what he's planning on doing. I thought that was a pretty funny gag. Yes, uh, so that was one of the the high points. I agreed. And there weren't a lot of references in this episode. I think the only reference is the song Three Coins in the Fountain. No, yeah. Other than other than talking about the different places when when Don and his wife are watching on television and you get to see these different places, uh that's that's the only references really that were there and most of those are pretty self-explanatory yeah, well, references. They should have done more B-roll cuz they're using the same shots in the shot where they're watching TV as they just used in the opening. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I noticed that too. Uh, the other thing I was going to say about about references to things, I did like the joke reference to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I mean, you can see it coming. The guy's yeah, standing there like that. You're going, well, this is what the joke's going to be. But just like the radio show, when you know what the joke's going to be, and then they come and they land it, you're like, yeah, that, that's funny. That, that was that was a good idea. Um, I do think, John, you just gave me something to think about. That I, I, that's why I love having you guys on the show because I'd never really thought about it, but. On the radio show, Jack did, was involved in the whole thing and was concerned about how the show presented itself. He was, he was directing as well as he was acting, as well as he was editing, as well as he was writing. He was involved in all of that. In the television show, I think he kind of let it go and said, I can't do all of this. One, yeah. I'm probably getting a little older yeah. and things, and I don't know television, and I'm going to just hire some of the best people to, to get around me to do this, and I'm going to trust them. And so you end up with less of less control of Jack's part of the show, I think. Uh, go ahead, Terry. Well, what just to piggyback on what you just yeah. said, um, that first television show that he did, which we talked about um, a few weeks ago, the very first thing he said, as you might remember, is I'd pay a million dollars to know what I look like right now. That's yeah. how removed he was from the process. And unlike today, where you could run a little video, record a little video, go and look at it, and where a lot of actors increasingly are directing their own films and television programs, that right. uh, option was not available to Jack Benny in the 1950s. And, and that probably has something to do with why he didn't go, you know, full force, like even Burns and Allen, and uh, folks like that in early TV, where he says, you know, it's all so complicated and I just can't give up you know, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, give up uh, that much of my control. Right. And John, you mentioned so, that um, he was getting a little older. He, in this episode, he's a few years older than I am now. And I've walked up those steps in Rome. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know how many takes they did, how many times he had to walk up and down. I hope not too many, because it would have been uh, difficult. Yeah. The, uh, I'll disagree with you a little bit about the the feel of it um in the sense that this was not at all a live show i mean it was this was like a a sitcom it was not a stage show which most of the earlier television programs were uh more like a a link to to vaudeville this was more of a link to what became modern television sitcom yes and mm -hmm. so you're right the timing was not ideal the uh the technology and the, you know, they were still figuring it out, right. but they did have a lot more control over it so that if there were mistakes, they would do it again and again until they got it right. right. But it did become a little less spontaneous. And for us who enjoyed the, uh, the, the radio so much, it, it was less uh, exciting and not so much fun. Still, I liked it. I, I liked the fact that they were able to, to make a little movie. It was shot with one camera, not three cameras. So it was not, live it was crafted and I, I liked how hard they worked on it and it was uh, it was filmed not this wasn't a, a kinescope this was a movie mm -hmm. the the other uh, observation that i'll make about the whole episode is that th th 
there were no surprises. I mean, Daryl, you mentioned this. We, we saw it all coming. Mm -hmm. It was partly because, you know, it's, it's now more than half a century later, we get yeah. this concept. Mm -hmm. But maybe in uh, when it was first broadcast, because of the war connection, because uh, we got to see Jack Benny, maybe it wasn't quite as um, uh, predictable as we now see it to be. And I think it's, I think it's a little unfair only to see it from today's perspective. Correct. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and so it was, for me, it was, it was fun to watch. And, and, um, and, and even though I, I also, I agree with you, I, I did see where some of these jokes were coming. Uh, there were, there were a few gems in there. And, and I know we're going to talk about Sean Connor in a moment. That was, that was one of them. Yeah. We'll yeah, get I, into it. I was going to say, yeah, let's get to the Sean Connery piece really quick. Uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was it was a fun bit. You could see how he could be later become a huge star and everything. I mean, you could see that star quality in him from that very little bit he did. I thought there'd be more callbacks to it or something later in the episode, but uh, I think he only appeared in the one scene. Extra. Yeah, and it was just a little. Does tiny anybody know how he got that? Does anybody no. know how he got that job? Did he just happen to be in, in Rome when they were shooting? Or it could can't imagine well they would have brought him in for this. No, uh-uh. He, was, I was, not, he was, was not known, right? No, no, no. Apart from, no, apart no. from in, done, in the UK. He'd done a couple things before this. I looked him up and he'd done a few things, but usually it was like as an extra or an untitled character person, you know. And his career really started to move after this. Uh, but even then, it really didn't do too much until until basically Doctor No and and his first Bond film, and then of course, totally did That's fantastic like and and went on from there. And then and then what's funny is after he does does the Bond films in the seventies, he does a few things here and there, and in the eighties, you know, a little bit. But really, it's the when he appears as um, the father of uh, Indiana Jones that all of a sudden it resurges his career and he's in tons of movies from like 89 until right around 2000 he's he's in a decent amount of films um he was kind of had this dormant Did, period in the 80s and the and the late 70s daryl do you want to let our, our viewers know or do you want to let them watch for it and wonder where sean connery is going to show up because we haven't said yet no, you want to I, leave that as a surprise. I think leave it as a surprise. I think why not? Why not leave it? As a surprise? <laughs> Let it go with that. But you'll see. Don't blink. It's fast, but but he he does yeah. do. It. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we'll leave this episode there and let people just enjoy it because uh, I do have one more thing I want us to cover before we head out. So enjoy the episode, and we'll see you guys next time. The Jack Benny Program. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the many countries Jack visited last summer during his European vacation was romantic Italy, and much of his time was spent in the beautiful city of Rome, eternal Rome, cradle of the arts with its forum, the Colosseum, its famous fountains, Rome, where day and night thousands of visitors arrive from all over the world. You know, dear, I read that tonight Jack is doing one of the films he made while I was over in Europe last summer. That's right, honey. Tonight we're going to see what happened to Jack while he was in Rome. Oh, oh look, Don. Isn't Rome a beautiful city? It certainly is. And isn't that the fountain of Trevi? Uh-huh. There's the forum. Oh, and there's the Coliseum. Well, and there's the airport where Jack arrived. Well, it didn't take us long to get through customs, did it? No. It was a great idea arriving in Rome in the evening and then up bright and early in the morning go sightseeing. Yes, sir. I did with those baggage, Jeff. You know, when you arrive in a big city late at night, it has its advantages because, you know, when you're as well known as I am, then you can sort of sneak in and. <laughs> no, for heaven's sake. What's the matter? 
For once, I thought I could get into a town without everybody knowing I'm here. <laughs> oh, well, I might as well get it over with. Let me have your pen. Here you are. Here they come. Who does he think he is? Why don't you get his autograph and find out? Very, I didn't come to Rome to get autographs. Well, I'll find out. All right, I'm going to buy a guy. Oh, miss, a uh, uh, guidebook. That's it. That's his. Well, I got it. Here it is. Who is he? His name is Victorio Rossetti. Means nothing to me. Please, will you follow me to the taxi, senor? Say, who is this fellow, Victorio Rossetti? Oh, he is the most famous opera singer in all Italy. Oh. Usually, when he arrives in Rome, oh, such a commotion. But tonight, he's trying to sneak in. <laughs> I'm sneaking in. You snuck in better than he did. Oh, come on. I have a reservation here. My name is Mary Livingston. Ah, yes, Miss Livingston. I received your telegram five days ago, and I have a very nice room for you, with a sun porch and everything. I have a reservation, too. Your name, please. Jack Benny. Jack Benny. Yes, Mr. Benny. You're a very lucky fellow. The hotel, she's almost all filled up. But I have one small little room left. One little room? But I sent for my reservation the same time she did. Maybe so, but I just received your postcard this morning. <laughs> Jack, it's your own fault. Well, yeah. Guess I should have sent it airmail. <laughs> Miss Livingston, will you please sign the register? The bellboy will take you to your room. Averti posto per me? Si, signor. È sempre un onore averlo a nostro albergo. Grazie, grazie tanto. That is Victorio Rissetti, the greatest opera singer in Italy. I know, I know. <laughs> will you show Miss Livingston to her room, please? Sì, signor. Well, have a good night's sleep, Jack. I'll see you in the morning. Okay. Good night, Mary. Good night. Mr. Fetty, will you sign the register, please? Yeah. Show Mr. Fetty to his room, please. This way, sir. <laughs> Why is that man standing like that? He used to be a guide at the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Nearly went to sleep without putting an entry in my diary. Let's see. <clears throat> Dear diary, tonight I am in Rome. When I arrived at the airport, even though I sneaked in, <laughs> there were over 50 people waiting just for an autograph. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> huh? Who said that? I did. It's a very misleading thing you wrote your diary. How many people were waiting for an autograph? Well, 40. <laughs> How many? 20? <laughs> Try again. All right, seven or eight. That's right. And whose autograph did they really ask for? Some opera singer by the name of Victorio 
Vittorio Rossetti? Yes. <laughs> now tear out that page and write the truth. Okay. Wait a minute. Read it back the way you first wrote it. Dear diary, tonight I am in Rome. When I arrived at the airport, even though I sneaked in, there were over 50 people waiting just for an autograph. Eh, leave it. It's only us. <laughs> Tomorrow I'm really going to see this town. All I need is a good night's sleep. Oh boy, I'm really tired. room to me to stop singing. The room next to you is not there. You mean Victorio Rissetti? That's the guy. You're the first man who wants Victorio to stop singing. He's a wonderful tenor. In fact, he has so many fans, tonight he had to sneak into town. I know, I know. <laughs> Rissetti will soon be popular in your country, too. Next month, he gives big concert in Carnegie Hall, New York, for $10,000. $10,000? $10, See? Only a year ago, he could not afford to pay the rent to live here. One day, an American came over. Uh, he had the same room as you have. He heard Victorio sing, he put him under contract. Ever since, Victorio and this American make over a million dollars. Look, I don't care what he made. I've got to get some rest, so tell him to cut out singing. Senor, he's such an important man, we cannot do that. Anyway, he's checking out of the hotel in the morning. Only before one night. Well, all right. See that it is. But it's quite late, Gregorio. <laughs> I could have sworn right. it leans the other way.
What are you laughing at? Well, when I called your room when you were gone, I knew I'd find you here. You knew? Yes, Jack. I hate to disillusion you, but that's only a song about three coins in the fountain. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, where are we going? Well, there's a place called Baroni's. I hear they have wonderful clubs, and I'd like to buy a pair. Where is it? Well, the room clerk at the hotel gave me the address. Here it is here. 45 Via Marguta, right off the Piazza de España. Well, that's near the Spanish Steps. Mm. Oh, and wait a minute. Have you got some change that I can get the cab driver? Take out whatever you want. Okay, I'll take this and this. Wait a minute. These coins are wet. <laughs> Only a song, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, where is it? Well, I don't know. Let's go down to the corner. Maybe it's there. Now, wait a minute, Mary. I'm not going to walk all over Rome aimlessly. I didn't have any sleep last night. We're going someplace. Let's find out where it is. I asked somebody. Oh, okay. Oh, mister. Yes, could you please tell me where Baroni's glove shop is? The glove of Baroni. Yes, sopra la scalinata, signora. Ma non sono certo esattamente. Thank you. Well, did you get it? I don't know. All I said, first we have to go to the top of the stairs. Okay. I wonder where it could... Mary, stop wondering and ask somebody else. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
slide. Where is it? At the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs? Then why did you wave to me? I didn't wave at you. What? Oh, there's that bee again. <laughs> Come on, let's go to Vitaly's. Okay, now I can do some shopping on the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll take a little nap before Mary and I go to dinner. My steps were murdered. You told me that Victorio Rossetti was checking out of the hotel. But, Signor Penny, Victorio Rossetti did check out this morning. This morning? And who's got that room next to me now? That is Emilio Garibaldi, a wine salesman who stays here whenever he comes to town. Well, I don't care who he is. Now, you tell him to stop singing or I'll... Hang up the phone. But I want to make him stop singing. Hang up the phone. We got more important things to do. The room clerk said that Victoria Rossetti and his agent made over a million dollars. I know. Well, this fellow sings as well as Rossetti. Don't you get it? If you sign up this wine salesman, you'll make a lot of money, too. Say, you're pretty smart. <laughs> I'm Jack Benny. I have the room right next to you. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> now, I'm in show business in the United States, and I have a proposition for you. May I come in? Please do. Thank you. Uh-huh. What's the proposition? Well, I want to bring you to America and make a great opera star of you. Me? Want to make an opera star out of me with my voice? Get that modesty. I got it, I got it. <laughs> now, here's my plan. You'll come back to the United States with me, I'll be your agent, and together we'll make a fortune. A fortune? And you're very lucky that I discovered you. You see, most agents take 50%. I'll only take 30. <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> I uh, just thought it over, and I'll take only 20%. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow, I'll get in touch with you. I'm going to take him to America and make a million dollars. Well, why would an opera singer sign with you? That's just it. He's not an opera singer. He's a wine salesman. Well, I hope you didn't take advantage of him. I gave him a sensational deal. The only thing is, he couldn't leave the country for about three or four months until he got rid of all of his wine. So I bought up all the wine he had, 60 barrels. I gave him $3,000. You bought 60 barrels of wine? Mary, I know what I'm doing. I'll get it all back on the first concert. You gotta think every minute. <laughs> Ah, Mr. Garibaldi. I want you to meet Miss Livingston. How do you do? Hello. Senor Benny, I called the wine company and told them that the 60 bottles of wine now belong to you. Good, good. And look, now that we're partners, how about singing a song for us? 
I'd be glad to. What would you like to hear? Oh, I don't know. Say something from Rigoletto. Rigoletto. All right. Mary, get a load of this. Sing like this. But before I came into your room, your voice was beautiful. Ah, that wasn't me. I was playing a record on my phonograph. A record? Yes, my favorite singer, Vittorio Rizzetti. <laughs> Vittorio Rizzetti? Now that's a singer that's not. I know, I know. <laughs> what have I done? It cost me $3,000. When does the boat sail? <laughs> oh, give me a home where we found. Well, thanks for the dinner, Jack. It was wonderful. I'll see you in the morning. Okay, okay. And please forget about that opera singer. You've been grumbling for two days. How can I forget about him? It cost me $3,000. Well, you didn't throw the money away. After all, you own 60 barrels of wine. Yeah, that's right. Oh, good night. Good night. <laughs> 